Like other spectroscopic techniques, carbon nuclear magnetic resonance, typically we would call this C13 NMR, depends on the absorption of light, electromagnetic radiation. The energy is so low, the wavelength is so long, that it's a stretch to call it light, but electromagnetic radiation is a perfectly appropriate term. Because we're looking directly at carbon atom, it's a very powerful tool since most all organic molecules are carbon in terms of their primary structure. So we get a lot of really good information when we're trying to determine the structure of an organic molecule. Let me highlight a few of the key points and then amplify them a bit by explanation. So we're using very low energy, really long wavelength, radio wavelength. These are much lower energy than the other wavelengths we've been talking about for other spectroscopic techniques, IR and UV, for example. So it's the nucleus of a carbon atom that's actually being excited, absorbing light. I'll explain that very briefly in a minute. Like other spectroscopic techniques, you observe many molecules simultaneously. You put a solution of a sample in a NMR tube, put it in the spectrometer, and look at all of those molecules simultaneously. With rather poor sensitivity, compared to other techniques that we're talking about, it takes a lot of sample for a carbon NMR. And fortunately then, the sample is not destroyed. You can recover that sample and do other things with it. And that's important since we're needing to use quite a bit of it. We obtain qualitative information, uh, not quantitative. So it's not like UV vis spectroscopy. We're not trying to answer the question how much of something is there. We're trying to understand what the structure of a molecule is. And there are two key types of qualitative information that we're going to talk about. Carbon NMR has become much more sophisticated and so the field of NMR spectroscopy goes way beyond what we're going to talk about. In its simplest applications, the ones we'll talk about, there are two types of information that carbon NMR provides. One is the number of types of carbon atoms. And by that, I mean the number of carbon atoms that are not magnetically equivalent. The second kind of information is the magnetic environments of these carbons. This translates into information about functional groups. Information would be which and relative location. So we get quite a bit from a carbon NMR. What we don't get is specific information about the numbers of carbon. We'll get information about the numbers of types. And we don't get information specifically about which carbon atoms are directly attached to which other carbon atom in this elementary application of carbon NMR that we're talking about, which distinguishes from proton NMR. And when we move to proton NMR, you'll see that we can see directly which protons are neighbors. Nevertheless, this is a useful technique. And let me talk a bit about the points as I've outlined them up there. First of all, just a quick comment about the excitation of carbon nuclei. Like all spectroscopic techniques, the absorption of light occurs because something is going from a lower energy state to a higher energy state. And in this case, that something is a nucleus. Now, all carbon nuclei normally have the same energy state, so there is no excitation. However, if a sample is placed in a magnetic field, the nuclei have a property called spin which either aligns with or against the magnetic field, and those are different energy states. Now, there'll be a few more at the lower energy state than the higher one. So the excitation can occur from the lower energy state to the higher one. The differential proportions of populations will be greater if we use stronger magnetic fields. So there are more in the lower energy state when we use strong energy fields, and that makes the technique more sensitive which is good because carbon NMR inherently is not a sensitive technique. Inherently, NMR is not a very sensitive technique. And carbon NMR is worse because 99% of carbon atoms natural bond is carbon-12. Carbon-12 is not observed in the NMR. We're looking only at carbon-13, which is about 1% of the population. So that rather poor sensitivity comes both because the technique is inherently relative in insensitive, and because we're not looking at 99% of our sample, we're only looking at about 1% of the atoms. 
fortunately, use the solution to obtain the spectrum and then recover the material from the solution. So we don't destroy the sample, and that's particularly useful. Now let me give you an example about the numbers of carbon types. And you'll see what I mean about this type of qualitative information. Let's look at this representative uh, spectrum of a relatively simple compound, 2-butanone. And before I go further, let me point out that this spectrum is obtained from the Japanese-based database that many, many people use. You can Google SDBS organic structures and come up with a URL for this website. Extremely useful. And I'm appreciative of the availability of spectra. The carbon NMR that we're looking at is an NMR for the following structure. You see right away that when we look at the structure, there are four types of carbon, carbons that are different from each other in some way. So I'm going to say A, B, C, D. And you might say, wait a minute, A and D are both methyl groups. True enough. But they're not the same methyl groups, are they? This is a methyl group that's attached directly to a carbonyl. This is a methyl group that's attached directly to a CH2. So they're distinctly different. And as a result, they'll have different magnetic environments. And they'll absorb in different places in the NMR spectrum. So as we look at the structure, we see that there's one, two, three, four different types of carbon and we see that there's four different signals. In fact, because of where they come in this spectrum, and we call this the chemical shift, the chemical shift of a carbonyl carbon is very typical for the being in the very furthest part to the left of the scale that we typically use for a carbon NMR. So when we see a signal down here, even greater than 200 ppm, that's parts per million, we can say right away, oh, carbonyl carbon. And so we can assign this signal to B. Of the others, two of these carbons are adjacent to carbonyl, and their magnetic environment will be affected by the carbonyl group itself. Remember, that's a polar bond. So the distribution of electron density is toward oxygen and partial positive toward carbon which shifts the magnetic environment of A and C to the point where those absorptions are further downfield. Downfield is in that direction, to the left, bigger numbers. And so we can readily say that this chemical shift for this methyl group would be D. Of the other two, one might wonder which is which, but it turns out that the substitution of an alkyl group tends to shift the chemical shift downfield some, so we're going to guess that this is a C and this is the one that is assigned to A. So from analyzing the chemical shifts of the signals we see, we can guess something about the functional groups. In this case, we can readily guess there's a carbonyl. We can guess that there are two signals from carbons attached to that carbonyl. And then there's another signal, a fourth type, that's not attached to the carbonyl. This doesn't tell us how many of each carbon we have. Notice that the height of these signals uh, all differ from each other. And yet, because we know the structure, we know that each of these signals represents one carbon atom in the molecule, not two or three. So the fact that this one is much stronger signal than the carbonyl signal doesn't tell us that there are more of those carbons. So we cannot determine from carbon NMR how many of a certain type of carbon we have that's a causing the signal we're observing. We can simply say there is a certain number of types. In this case, there are four types. And in this case, it happens to be there's one of each. Analysis of chemical shift tells us something about functional groups present and where other carbons are in the molecule relative to that functional group. Very powerful information. One more example to give you another sense of what a carbon NMR looks like. I picked this sample intentionally to be similar in some ways and distinctly different in others from this other structure that we just looked at. Here is an aromatic ring, one of those rings that has, in valence bond theory, alternating single and double bonds. They're all exactly equivalent. And then there's a carbon atom here that's a carbonyl group and a methyl. Now, if we take a careful look to see how many types of carbon atoms in that molecule, we'll do the following type of assignment. Well, here's one, call it A. Here's another carbon type, B. 
Here's the third one, C. And then these two guys that are attached to C are totally equivalent. So I'm going to say D and D. And these two guys that are attached to D are totally equivalent. So I'm going to call them E. And then this one, well, that's different from the C, D, E ones, isn't it? Because it's the furthest away from where the carbonyl is attached. So I'll need to call that F. And as we count the number of types, then we have one, two, three, four, five, six types. Now we're ready to take a look at the carbon NMR. Well, we notice again that there's a signal way downfield that corresponds to carbonyl. So we can readily say that that corresponds to B. We notice that there's a signal way up field, so this would be A. Notice there's one carbon of each, but they're not the same intensity. Carbonyl absorptions typically are weak. And then take a look at this. We're looking for four more types, and we have three signals. There's only five signals in this spectrum, not six. It simply means that two signals overlap. It's common. Makes uh, interpreting NMR a little less straightforward. And of these, we might be tempted to guess that this is C because it shifted downfield, attached to carbonyl. And beyond that, we would be best advised to be cautious about which these are, D, E, and F. So being cautious people in terms of making structure assignments, we're going to say that these two signals account for three carbon, D, E, and F, and we won't say which is which. And did you notice that they're all different intensities? One of these signals is being caused by two carbon atoms, the signals overlap. That might be the, the one that's the greatest intensity, very likely is. But we can't say that because there's no good correlation between the intensity of signals and how many carbons there are. And if this is a signal that's caused by two, then these individual signals here are caused by one each, but they're very different intensity. So my point, we can say how many types of carbons there are. We can say something about the functional groups. We can say something, again, about which atoms are close to which functional groups, like in this case, A is attached to B. And because of the chemical shift here, this chemical shift in this area is typical of carbons involved in double bonds and carbons involved in aromatic rings. So in this area, in this region here, we see sp2 carbon and aromatic or vinyl. We can't say, but from other information, you usually can guess whether we're talking about an aromatic ring or not. In this case, we know we are. So, carbon NMR, very powerful. It gives you some information about functional groups. In this example, carbonyl, aromatic rings, and how many types of carbons we have. And of those types, which ones are near each other? For proton NMR, we're going to discover there's even more information we can get.